Hello and welcome to my bedroom. This is Russell Howard's home time. It's a little show trying to cheer you up. So let's crack on. This man wins my award for Easter egg of the week. Fair to say, some people really struggling with homeschooling. Pop. Pop. Sickle. Popsicle. <laughs> Here's a tip. Don't ever drink and film. So, some good news. The Spanish have gone back to work. The UK death rate is slowing. And over in Hong Kong, pandas mate for first time in 10 years after coronavirus shuts down zoo. Incredible! Who knew all it took for pandas to shag was leaving them alone? <laughs> Oi, you two, why aren't you banging? Pandas like that, because I'm in a cage and I'm surrounded by children. You try pumping when you're being stared at by a six-year-old. Poor zookeeper. He spent a decade trying to get them to do it. Just, hey, she, whoa, blah, whoa, she, whoa, hey, whoa, just go with her. As soon as he leaves, the panda's like, oi, Lily, fancy a shag? I thought you'd never ask, Chi Chi. Bend me over the bamboo. 10 years. They hadn't had sex, but can you imagine how wild it was? I bet the other animals look like this. Fuck me. You think you know your neighbours. <sighs> no wonder she's got black eyes as her titties knocking her in the face. <laughs> now talking of shocking, did anyone else see what Nigel Farage wore on Facebook Live? First he's talking bollocks, now he's showing them. Who's dressing him? The bloke from the money supermarket ad? Christ, no wonder the gopher behind him looks terrified. Talking of shocking, what part of lockdown do some people not get? We're all having to stay in. We're trying to protect our fellow man to help the NHS. But oh no, some people are out there sunbathing, cycling, whatever this is. 600 house parties had to be broken up in Manchester. I mean, Christ, one family went on a Pokemon hunt. What a bunch of morons. You think I'm shocked? Listen to Pikachu. Fuck me. Why the fuck are you flouting the fucking rules just to fucking fight one of fucking me? It doesn't make any fucking sense. Pikachu's right. Unnecessary trips could cost lives. Besides, there's loads you can do inside. You can have a dance. You can play a musical instrument. Or you can get a marker pen and pretend your baby's completed the Joe Wicks challenge. Right, let's crack on with our first guest. Later on, I'll be talking to an intensive care doctor. But first up, it's my old flatmate and one of the best comedians in the country, John Richardson. You're used to seeing him like this. I've written an erotic novel <laughs> based on my own life. <laughs> oh, God. It's called Deep Clean. But today, we find him here. Oh, Hello. Wow. Bloody hell. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Everything about that screams breakdown. <laughs> you know I mean, me so well. What I, 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 what, what? What, what are you wearing, what? mate? What, what are you wearing? Well, depressingly, the, the way the world has gone means, Russell, that you are currently my only employer. Um, right. You've got the look of the, the accountant of an Eastern European Bond villain. <laughs> right. There's a lot for me to unpack there. Now, where are you? I am in uh, The Dog and Bastard, which is uh, our garage, which I've converted into a sort of 1970s uh, tobacco-stained pub. It's where I spend most of my time. Yeah. It's a godsend is what it is. It's, it's a man who's been preparing for a situation like this his entire life. Well, in many ways, you are the Nostradamus. You've essentially been worrying your whole life. Mm -hmm. And you've built a bunker. You've built a little John Richardson bunker full of booze. You're ready. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's got, it's got everything I need in here, with the exception of sort of food and vitamins and sustenance and other people. But my list of what I need is quite short, and it's all in here. 
absolutely. How how are you coping with um, with lockdown in general? You're right. Yeah, I think I'm all right. You, you know, I think we, we all go through a similar thing of occasional bouts of self pity and isn't it hard? And then you watch 37 seconds of news and think, oh no, I'm all right actually. Probably uh, keep my gob shut and um, accept that we're doing all right. And having a sort of three year old in the house is like a blessing and a curse. She's like, it's just constant stimulation needed, but that stops me sitting on my phone and checking news. So, yeah. a godsend. How do you think we would have survived? if lockdown had occurred when we lived together? Oh, I don't think we would have. No, I don't think we would have survived. I think I probably would have sort of Reggie parent it about day two or three. Yeah. I probably would have just said, I'm just going for my daily exercise. And then I don't think you'd have ever seen me again. Yeah, I think we'd find you, you know, like they find people 20 years later and you go, geez, he's been living in the woods all that time. Yeah, they call me the hedgehog man. <laughs> Check, check for John before you light your bonfires. <laughs> I love that, man. Um, I mean, what stage are you at? You're with the family, right? I'm living with my mum and dad. So yeah. I've re regressed. Um, as you can see in, just, just there, it's a picture of Robbie Hello! Solo. Hello! That what was, was my three-year-old opening the door, shouting loser and running away. So, um, did she shout loser? <laughs> she did. She just called me a loser and ran away. She's uh, her current catchphrase is "See you later, suckers," and she's not quite sure when that's appropriate, so she just peppers it in. Yeah, most times. Not, Lucy's not still breastfeeding, is she? Because that would be a phenomenal way of saying she's had enough. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think she is. She's certainly not breastfeeding Elsie. Whether or not she's sneaking out at night, and um, she did actually say at one point, I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to say this, but. She said when lockdown first happened, what a shame that I stopped breastfeeding because I would have been a sort of natural resource that we could have tapped as if there would come a point when we've run out of oat milk and I sort of latch on. Yeah, I think you sort of see but a lot of bodybuilders do that. Apparently breast milk yeah. very good. Yeah, get it online, he knows. A lot of bodybuilders, he says. We've all seen you growing over the years. Yeah, and the fact that I'm at home is a pure coincidence. No, uh, <laughs> yeah. How's Nanette? Is she has she dried up or is she still? <laughs> <laughs> she's um yeah, she's gone, man. So where are you now then? Which bedroom is that? You're you're not at home. No, I'm in Bath. I'm um my wife is on the front line working for the NHS as a doctor, and um she also has another doctor living in my house with her, and um I am in Bath because she didn't want to have to worry about me being in one part of the house and her being in one part of the house. It's, uh, it's bleak, but like you say, it could be a hell of a lot worse. Is there an album or anything you're listening to at the minute? Have you got a tip for people to listen to while they're bored at home? Um, wow, going back to the old six music days. Um, mm. I don't think I've bought an album from the last 20 years. Well, I'm, I've, been I've been listening, listening to a lot of nineties. If I if I'm doing my daily exercise, I go back to the last time the world seemed in a good place, and that was. Are you uh, exercising? Are you exercising? I'm trying my best. Yeah, I'm really trying. Yeah, I imagine you are a terrible farter when you work out. Come on, let's not go. Let's not go back to that incident that you remember because that was a different time. I think I was unwell at that time, um, yeah. and you know, I was still eating meat then. So if you're going to tell that story... I'm just then... saying, you are the only person that I know that has cleared out a Christmas party at a house through farts. Well, parties have to end at some point. You say that, but I remember you vividly leant against the fridge on the floor saying, I can't stop farting. <laughs> and... It was the real... Like, what were we in then? We were in a small flat, weren't we? And I... We were... it... I sort of thought, well, I can sneak into a quieter room, but it just clung. I mean, it clung to the walls. <laughs> I've never had a day like it. It just, I honestly thought I'd got away with it. And then I'd be having a conversation with someone whose eyes would tear up. And I last let one go five minutes ago. And there was still just mist in their eyes. Well, I thought everyone was happy. And then I realized everyone was breathing through their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was the same house party that you poured Rice Krispies into our chocolate fountain under That's the right. misguided belief that it would make sort of cascading Rice Krispie cakes rather right. than grind to a halt. I was trying to help though, wasn't I? You were trying to help in your way, but, yeah. And you were right. I fucked it. 
Well, it's just that it's the, it's the gap between having the idea and doing it that I think your professional inventor, that can be months. You know, you have the idea and then you test the practicality of it. Perhaps at the end of six months, you're a millionaire. Whereas with you, the idea and the performance, there's no gap in between. Mm. So, you know, your, your brain gets to the point of, oh, maybe I could. And you're already pouring Rice Krispies into the chocolate fountain. Yes. And one and day you'll hit pay dirt, but you'll ruin a lot of chocolate fountains <laughs> on the way. Elegantly put. Now, what, what are you missing? Are you, are you missing something from, from normal life? Is there... It's, um... Yeah, I miss not being anxious all the time about everyone. You know, the, uh, the, there's been very few things in our life where so many people are affected. We were talking about this. One of the, one of the, um, one of the worst things about this is, is, as a comedian, we get to do loads of benefit gigs for kind of various charities around the country. And at the minute, everyone's talking, obviously, about the NHS and food banks, but there's lots of other charities that are struggling in the minute. Now, you know somebody... Yeah. Uh, my, yeah, my friend Martin, we had a gig that we were due to do last week. The tickets had been sold. The theatre was full. That money is obviously being held, waiting to go to the charity. And then the gig is, you know, cancelled, postponed. So it will happen at some point. But that money is now not, not with the charity who desperately need it. And I think we're actually going to try and get Martin on the line now. How are we doing? Oh, Martin. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Martin, could you tell us a little bit about the charity? So Muscular Dystrophy UK um, supports families around the UK with muscle wasting conditions, uh, with an advocacy service as well as funding world-class research. What's happened with this crisis that we're all going through at the minute is there is now a £2.8 million funding gap uh, for the charity. They now face that. You guys were doing a, a gig for Muscular Dystrophy. Yeah. And unfortunately that can't take place. So what John thought we would do is me and John can do like a virtual gig for the charity and try and raise some money. Is yeah, it, that, would be, that would be absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. The, and you set a simple bar that Russell Howard and I do an Instagram live gig and need to raise £2.8 million. Pounds. So that's, that's <laughs> right now. <isn't> <laughs> I mean, we're going to have to do. We're going to have to do the lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but we'll do anything to raise. Will we do anything? We'll do. We'll, we'll do some we'll things. Do, we'll do some things to yeah. raise to raise money for you. Um, you know, thanks for coming on the show, Martin and John. Um, Thank you. Is, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Genuinely, um, I will see you both after this, um, and. Um, Take care of yourself. Stay safe. Stay well, everyone. Take care. See you later, mate. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, me and John are going to do an Instagram Live for Muscular Dystrophy UK. Hopefully, we'll raise a bunch of money. The details will be on my socials in the next couple of days. Uh, that's the end of the first half. Join me for part two while I'll be interviewing an intensive care doctor. Welcome back to the show. Over in Italy, this dad is a genius. Oh, no, yes. Others, not quite so gifted. Talking of sports, if you're missing your fix, this commentator has got you covered. 20 seconds to go now. Olive closing in on victory and that coveted prize of being told she's a very good dog. One paw to control and a switch. Now Mabel sensing this might be a chance, still waiting, still believing. And you wonder what Olive is doing here, only has to hold on. Going to the upright though, high tariff with no opposable thumbs, high risk at this stage. And it's gone and Mabel takes it. No mercy from the younger dog who takes this victory just as time runs out. A famous win built on patience and sheer belief. My next guest is a frontline NHS intensive care doctor. Her name is Aoife Abbey. She's also the author of the book, Seven Signs of Life. Please welcome to the show, Aoife Abbey. Hey, Russell. Waving. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I thought you were going right, to wave. Thanks. You a waver? There you go. Yeah, nice. So, Aoife, you're a uh, consultant in intensive care. Take us through um, what, what that job entails. So, 
I look after patients. Um, I look after patients with a whole raft of conditions. So the beautiful thing about intensive care is that every single day is different. How is kind of morale at the moment? I think on the whole, it's surprisingly good, like right. phenomenally good. But I don't want that to make it sound like people aren't going through terrible times because it's really it's been really hard to cope with like all these tiny things that disrupt your day. You know, not being able to walk in and out of your intensive care unit freely without ten layers of PPE on you. Um, yeah, lots of things are, are very very difficult. You know, there's lots and lots of challenges. But on the whole, like the team that I work with in Coventry are absolutely phenomenal. And because that's the thing that I often think about that it's not only the, the physical toll, it's the emotional toll of it because you're looking after these people and presumably are you worried about getting it? Is that part of, of it as well? Yeah, I mean, I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't intermittently afraid. Like it's just something that builds up in you. Because you're so busy, you just get on with it. Like, you know, yeah. it's, you're scared, but what can you do? Only just do what you're trained to do so you get on with it. If you could give anyone a message, what would it be? You know, I think the main thing is just to stay at home, follow the advice and be sensible. You know, to date, there's been the equivalent of four years worth of deaths on the road. And that's is happened that right? in five weeks. Yeah. And, you know, people don't have to be scared, but they do have to be sensible. Um, because at the end of all of this, I don't know how many people will have lost their lives and been seriously affected. But I would presume that the least somebody wants to do is be able to look back and say, well, they did their best. And your best is following the advice. So please do it. Yeah. Oh, you've actually made me feel quite emotional there because that's, that is exactly, we should fess up. Like your best friends with my wife. And that's exactly what you're both doing is that you're, completely doing your best like it's quite the thing that i find very difficult watching the news is when you see the doctors covered in um all the ppe stuff and to think that that someone you love is is day in day out putting themselves at risk to save others is utterly humbling um mm -hmm. you know it just feels like we should do more than clap is clapping enough I mean, to be honest, when I heard about the clapping, I kind of felt like, you know, you want to hide behind the sofa and be like, oh my God, this is, I can't believe this is, this is happening. But about last Thursday, um, where I work in Coventry, we had this thing where at eight o'clock, we had a fire truck turn up and a whole lot of police cars and some, and, you know, staff and ambulances and the helicopter overhead. And they all just stood there and clapped and, you know, we clapped for them and they clapped for us. And there was something about that solidarity that was like, it's just really unbelievable. Like, I, yeah. I can't even put it into words. You sort of hope that one of the legacies of this is that it will be impossible for future governments to underfund the NHS. Do you know what I mean? It just feels like yeah. it's been, it's been proven so valuable that we yeah. can't... Uh, yeah, that would be nice. Over. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, yeah. You wrote a book called The Seven Signs of Life. Um, it's sort of about the experiences of a doctor at the beginning of her career working in, in intensive care. Does Do you find yourself uh, sort of naturally thinking about how to kind of convey what you're going through in, in, in another book? Or is that not, or are you just focusing on a job? At the moment, I'm focusing on the job. I mean, I'm a fairly reflective person, so I do always think about how I feel about things. And, you know, people's stories matter to me and narratives matter to me, but I'm certainly not right now, this minute, writing yeah. a book. Now, I've got a special treat for you. Can you go like that? Right, because this is just a treat. Wait one second. I've got a friend, Aoife. So there you go. <gasps> hey, it's Arch! Greetings. Oh, it's, the, it's your favourite Irish doctor. <laughs> so, um, is there anything you'd like to say? Look, look at this. This is Look at that solidarity. Even Arch is applauding. <laughs> he's not filming himself. He's just applauding. Aoife, thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolute pleasure. Um, 
you're my second favorite doctor in the world. You have easily the most color coordinated bookshelf I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on and I'll see you soon. Thank you. I've said it before. I'll say it again. We cannot convey how grateful we are to everybody that works for the NHS. And as a way of saying thank you, on top of the applause, here's a song from the brilliant Gavin Osborne. Hey Russ. Yeah, this song's called Born in the NHS. Even in the 80s you stood for universal fairness Back when dentists gave us sweets for good behaviour And Bevan would be proud to see more mental health awareness You're the ones on the front line trying to save us £20 billion pounds in Tory cuts might keep the bankers sweet Then they wonder why the wards are fit to burst in But as that banner said when millions marched on down in street Why don't you leave the cutting to the surgeons? You will be there even if we lack the means You will always be free at the point of need For the lives that you have saved From the cradle to the grave We will fight for you in our last breath Cos we were born in the NHS your patience for our patients, from GPs to A&D Deserves respect and we won't let you fail No, we will stand and say to every private company Hands off our NHS, it's not for sale All my clothes, my shoes, my records, they all belong to me I'll protect what's mine inside my own four walls but the best thing that I own, I share with this society Cos the NHS belongs to us all You will be there even if we lack the means You will always be free at the point of need For the lives that you have saved From the cradle to the grave We will fight for you with our last breath Cos we were born in the NHS Oh, we were born in the NHS Yeah, we were born in the NHS Oh, it makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Thanks very much for watching the show. Get up for my guests, John Richardson, Martin Highwood, Aoife Abbey and Gavin Osborne. I've got a hashtag called Home Time. Hit me up on that. I'll see you on Thursday. P-p-p-peace!